Do you think that there's kind of this cauldron, it seems like, of the revolutionary mindset mixed together with uh, an ignorance of history? But is there someone stirring that pot? Is there someone that you think maliciously is using identity politics? We all know someone who thinks like a victim, right, in our personal lives, family or friends or whatever. What happens though when you multiply that by tens of thousands of people or millions of people? Hey everyone, we're uh, here today with a very special guest, Mark Milkey, who's a uh, prolific author, columnist, and uh, public policy analyst. And you got a new book, The Victim Cult, How the Culture of Blame Hurts Everyone and Wrecks Civilizations. And that's a thesis statement that uh, I think has never been truer and uh, needs to be said. So I thank you for taking the time to, to chat with us today. Uh, my first question would be, uh, maybe it's kind of an obvious one, but why did you write the book? Well, um, this was a book about eight years in the making, the research and writing. And it actually started with an observation I made over the years. I'd, I'd done a lot of Aboriginal policy in Canada. And what I noticed was that the First Nations leaders who um, didn't forget about the past, well knew their past, well knew the past in Canada, but said, okay, we need to bracket that, right? Because looking back 50 years or 100 years or 150 years, and blaming today on the past is not going to work. And in fact, the, the gentleman who wrote the foreword, Ellis Ross from the Highs of First Nation, uh, agreed with me and um, so, saw the same problem I did, that some, and I emphasize only some, First Nations leaders who did this, who looked back and blamed all of today on what happened in the past, um, missed opportunities in the present. And so I grew up around Kelowna, and one of the most successful First Nations in the country is the West Bank First Nation. They're entrepreneurial. They have a former private property where they lease out land for homes for 99 years. Well, there's a difference between them and some other First Nations, even in beautiful places in the Okanagan, that don't take advantage of those beautiful locations. And so the, pro the problem really we started with that observation, like, okay, we all know someone who thinks like a victim, right, in our personal lives, mm. family or friends or whatever. What happens though when you multiply that by tens of thousands of people or millions of people? And as I began to do research, I began to see this was not an unusual phenomenon. It wasn't just maybe a First Nations leader somewhere in Canada who blamed everything today on the past. This has happened throughout history. I mean, I go, I go all the way back to Rome. But that's really where it started was an observation that if you as a person and uh, your collective really think that what happened 50 years ago or 500 years ago in some cases or a thousand years ago in some cases is why you're in a certain situation today, you may be missing a more direct, obvious causal link today. Right, and it's interesting, you mentioned you went all the way back to, to ancient Rome and mm -hmm. kind of studied this throughout history. Right. Is there, has this been on the upswing though in Canada from the research and at, uh, you know, looking into the facts? Well, it, it seems like it has been recently, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the problems with you know, victim cults or people who think of themselves as a victim, and they may have been, and they may not have been, right? It depends. And I would never downplay actual victimization. It occurs every day in history, right? Mm -hmm. It occurs now. I mean, in the history of the planet, there's been 113 billion people, right? There's 7 billion of us alive today. We're gonna bump into each other and create victims even accidentally, right? Even when people don't intend to. Um, but has it been in the upswing? I think so. And I think part of this is really a misunderstanding of economics. I mean, why, you know, to, to blame something that happened, you know, to blame your present state on, on something that happened 50 years ago or 100 years ago, or look at the economy as a fixed pie, I think there's a whole bunch of misconceptions today and, uh, and a lack of history. And maybe that's why it's rising up again today. So for example, um, in Canada, the first anti-discrimination laws against discriminating against someone based on their, their skin color or their gender or their ethnicity was in Ontario in the early 1950s. Like 70 years ago is when Canadian legislatures began to pass legislation against discrimination based on skin color. And you know, uh, we were, and your listeners and viewers are probably familiar with the United States, where you know, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Well, before then, of course, if you were a black American, I mean, you could be discriminated against based on your skin color at a restaurant or a motel. But that was 60 years ago and 70 years ago in the case of Canada. And yet we have people today that think there's institutional um, or systemic racism. It's like, no, those began to be addressed back in the early 1950s. So I think part of the problem these days is this lack of historical awareness and then combine it with identity politics where maybe in place of faith or in place of 
I don't know, your favorite sports team, your mm -hmm. identity literally is your skin color, your ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very, very dangerous. But I think it's come back because maybe every generation has to figure out that it's a really bad idea to look at people uh, based on their skin color, or ethnicity, um, and especially in our age, assume cause and effect from that. Now, from my experience, from my vantage point, one of the main kind of perpetrators of this and, and continuing mm. to entrench this victim culture, victim cult uh, into our society has been at universities. Mm -hmm. And so do you agree with that assessment? Any Absolutely. idea why that, why that would be the case? Well, I mean, think about your average 20 year old, no offense, right? <laughs> like We were all 20 at some point. Um, I may be a little farther away from that than you or others, but um, nonetheless, when you're 20, there's the old joke about how, you know, 20, you know, when you're when you're 15, your parents don't know everything. And by the time you're 20 or 25, it's amazing how much your parents have learned. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're 20 in university, you may encounter a wrong or what you think to be a wrong for the first time. And you think, well, why is there this disparity or why isn't the world perfect? And it's really easy to become self-righteous until you learn a little bit of history about why, you know, there may be a disparity. Um, and so, you know, this debate goes on in the United States, for example, over, you know, the state of the average, you know, black American earns X percent less than other Americans. Well, why does that disparity exist? It has everything to do with family structure, education levels, right? Um, but, you know, if you don't know that, then you blame everything immediately on maybe skin color. And that, that again, can be very dangerous because then you, 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 you don't look for other effects into this, this kind of average. Right, and you're kind of, I guess, pointing to ignorance there. Uh, right. And I think ignorance of history is a huge... Well, uh, and also a revolutionary mindset, right? Right. I mean, when you think about most, you know, anybody in any age, where are the revolutionaries? You know, late teens, early 20s, into their 30s. You know, they can be Vladimir Lenin or they can be a hothead on a university campus who sees some wrong and you want a purpose in life, right? And I, I, again, I don't downplay real tragedies, but or real victimization. But I think on university campuses these days, again, there's a, you know, this this comes from something called critical theory. It also comes from this notion that um, I don't know that uh, any disparity must be must be traced to someone's ill will as opposed to other factors. Do you so, think that there's kind of this cauldron, it seems mm -hmm. like, of the revolutionary mindset mixed together with uh, an ignorance of history? But is there someone stirring that pot? Is there someone that you think? maliciously is using identity politics and this victim culture to kind of further their political well, aims. Well, yeah, there, there's a lot of blame to go around, right? I mean, historically, ironically, it's European philosophers and, and what's you know called kind of a deconstruction, right? And, and also this critical theory, right? I mean, you've got uh, you know Foucault, a philosopher of Foucault, and it's this notion that actually reality doesn't e exist independently of us, that, that everything's a function of power, right? So that the economy is a function of power. Mm -hmm. It's like the old Marxist belief, right? Where, you know, you just command something and it'll happen, right? You command your workers to produce something, they will, irrespective of whether they've got a decent wage or you can make a profit. Same thing now, there's this notion that reality is bendable and that if we just order everyone to have an equal outcome, it doesn't matter if they're a recent immigrant with, you know, no English language skills versus maybe a, you know, 16th generation Canadian, um, who, you know, has an education and language skills. And of course, there's going to be a disparity in outcomes. So I think there's, there's great ignorance there. Um, there is this notion that reality is just a, you know, is just a function of power. And that mm -hmm. comes from, again, these, these academic theories that often are just detached from reality. Now, switching back to the, to the university specifically and this idea of, of the victim culture, yeah. uh, I feel one of these things you keep hearing about over and over again are microaggressions, mm -hmm. people being victims of these right. microaggressions on university campuses right. or at society at large. Can you kind of explain sure. uh, what those are and how those factor into this entire conversation? Well, microaggressions can be, I guess, a glance or a look or a comment that someone you know, takes the wrong way and thinks it's, it's meant to be racist. And who knows, in some cases it could be. There are racists in the world. Um, but that's very different than an institutional systemic discrimination that exists in laws or policy, where, for example, uh, you know, you couldn't enter certain schools or buses or you had to take a different bus seat, you know, pre-1964 Civil Rights Act or before the 1950s in Canada, where we passed legislation and legislatures and parliaments against this sort of nonsense, against this sort of actual systemic racism. Um, so the microaggression, though, it's almost like people are searching for a reason to be offended. Mm -hmm. In the victim cult, one of the things I do is I look at, for example, uh, a California example. 
I mean, it, it was at UCLA, Los Angeles. I mean, this be, must be one of the most diverse cities on the planet. The campus must be one of the most diverse campuses on the planet. And there was a young fellow um, who was offended because his 80-year-old professor, who was very tolerant, loved international relations, taught international students, and they loved him, asked this particular student to spell black with a lowercase b, as has been traditional in you know, grammar for decades, forever. Uh, he didn't like that he corrected that um, mistake by the student. Uh, the, the student, and you know, this has become even more controversial since, the student said, no, you must capitalize that, right? Wasn't, you know, and he also disagreed with the Chicago uh, style guide. <laughs> so mm. he just wanted to do his own thing and apparently didn't seem to want to put in the, the effort to learn proper grammar in the Chicago uh, style guide for writing essays. So he accused his 80-year-old professor of being racist. And he, and he said, you know, you've, you've put some microaggressions in my direction. I mean, it was absolute nonsense, but you see this. And it's actually kind of a search. It's, you know, if you can't see any smoke, well, it just means the fire must be really well hidden. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of this thing with microaggressions. It's like, I mean, think about this. You're a black soldier who comes back from World War II and you're beat up by a racist cop in 1945. And it goes to trial later on, um, you know, in a, in a Southern state and the cop is let off. Well, that's institutional racism. That's systemic racism. And you can't go to any lunch counter you want. And your, your kids can't go to any school they want. That is racism, mm -hmm. deep racism, deep systemic racism. So microaggressions to me seem to be often a, a, you know, a, a too sensitive attempt to find racism where probably in most cases it doesn't exist. And, and it may be a disagreement between an 80 year old and a 20 year old on how to spell something properly in a paper. And it is. Do you have any ideas or theories why some countries or some cultures seem to have a greater proclivity to kind of fall victim to this mindset, the, the, the victim cult mindset, if you will? I mean, I know you've talked sure. a lot about um, uh, Asian Americans or, or Asian right. Canadians who faced a lot of discrimination in the past, but today have found incredible success and you don't right. hear uh, as much about uh, that kind of stuff. Well, it's probably part culture you know, and also part uh, response to what happens. So for example, again, there's, there's no shortage of real victims in, in, the wor in world history. Mm -hmm. So to give you a quick example of real victimization, but which then went viral and destructive, Germany. Most people are aware of, you know, the, the kind of narrative in Nazi Germany, right? We were victims of the Versailles Treaty in World War I and Adolf Hitler's promulgation of the same. Well, to understand Nazi Germany, though, you have to go all the way back to like the late 1700s when Germany was a victim of France. The French were in German territories, you know, and doing awful things to Germans. But once Germany kicked them out, it began to try and establish an identity. And it, it you know, what, what does it mean to be German? And so it actually looked for kind of, well, you know, how do we be culturally pure? How do we make Germany great again? That was actually kind of the question. And to use a modern, you know, phrase. And um, so they looked for how to become pure culture, uh, pure German. Uh, and then later in the century, they get into pure racism, right? It, it was a search for an identity, which is very dangerous because they excluded everyone who wasn't born in Germany, not Protestant, mm -hmm. not white, not Christian, and so on and so forth. So it wasn't just the French they didn't like. They didn't like the Jews. They didn't like Eng English people. They didn't like liberalism. And it was really collectivist. So I think they had a bent already to being victims because of France and the French invasion of Germany in the 1700s. But then the response to it was utterly uh, tragically wrong and it ended up wrecking their civilization and everyone else. And I guess uh, to, a, to, to further that point is what they were doing back then is this it was kind of an extension of identity politics, was, was viewing it people totally as was. part of a collective yeah. identity as this, instead of individual sovereign individuals. Right. right. And this is actually the danger with being enamored with collectivism mm -hmm. or your identity. Because look, none of us can change our skin color. None of us can change our ethnicity. None of us can change where we were born. And so people today who practice identity politics, in the victim cult, I go through Germany, I go through Rwanda where identity politics happened between the Hutu and the Tutsis, and the Hutu killed Tutsis in a massacre in 1994 because they were Tutsis. So identity politics is really dangerous when it metastasizes. But on the, on the positive side, how do you, you know, why do some cultures avoid this? It's almost as if there's a, you know, again, an understanding of what's going to make one successful. So for example, at the end of the victim cult, one of the things I try and do is look for positive examples of where people were actually victimized, but they didn't allow themselves to get stuck there because they saw or, or maybe sensed it would be dangerous. And I look at um, Americans and Canadians to Japanese and Chinese descent. Um, so in the case of the United States, there's some great data. 
The Chinese started to come around in the 1850 to the California coast because of the gold rush. The Japanese arrived in the 1870s. Both these groups are heavily discriminated against for a century in the United States. But what they do, there are certain things they do. For one thing, they fight back. In the victim cult, I never advise people to just lay down and take it if they're actually victimized. The Chinese and the Japanese uh, Americans of that age actually fight back. They begin to like go to court where they can, and sometimes they win court cases against discriminatory um, bylaws, for example, in San Francisco against Chinese laundries. They literally have to go to court to win their rights to operate a Chinese laundry in San Francisco. So you see this fight back, which is positive. But also, with their children, a key um, reason why Chinese and Japanese Americans and other, uh, other Asian Americans eventually flourish is they said to their kids, basically, it doesn't matter what's happening outside, you're going to get an education. Mm. And there are some interesting statistics I found that, for example, in 1910, Chinese and Japanese American kids are graduating at rates slightly lower than white Americans from high school and college. By the 1920s and 1930s, the, the kids in California and across the United States, the children of Japanese and Chinese Americans, they're graduating at rates much higher than white Americans. Now, this is the most discriminatory period in American history against Asian Americans. Nonetheless, Asian Americans are setting the foundation of a future success. So there's education reasons, there's entrepreneurial reasons, they're very entrepreneurial, uh, in part because they have to be sometimes because they're banned from certain professions. And, and there are cultural reasons, right? And they, they refuse to be permanent victims and they refused, by the way, to silo themselves. They wanted to be part of American society. They wanted to integrate. They wanted to be, become part of mainstream in America, not by giving up their entire identity as Japanese Americans or Chinese Americans, but because they saw that you know, this was a land of opportunity and they were going to force, help other Americans to live up to their ideals, and they did. So this is a very positive example of where Chinese and Japanese Americans say to you know, racists in the United States at the time, we're not gonna let you keep us down. And they fought it for a century and eventually, you know, the attitudes and the laws change. Which is, I mean, what you just kind of laid out there is such a shining example mm -hmm. of how to, how to push back against yeah. uh, real discrimination and real uh, racist laws in the past and be, and be successful yeah. uh, not too long after. Right. Uh, it shows what, what is possible. So Well, and it puts the lie to the notion that we're beset by systemic yeah. racism today. Yeah. If you look at American statistics or Canadian statistics, you'll find at the top, um, you know, Asian Americans are at the top of that in specific cohorts, right? Mm -hmm. If you're Taiwanese or if you're from India, mm -hmm. you know, if you're from South Korea, if you're from Japan, your medium or average incomes are much higher than other Americans, right? Mm -hmm. So it kind of puts the lie to the notion that there's systemic racism of the sort of gain that, you know, black Americans had to endure for, uh, for nigh forever, right? Until mm -hmm. the 1960s civil rights movement and attitudes change. What do you think could be or will be the consequences for Canada if we kind of continue down this path of ever, of ever more of this corrosive uh, ideology of identity politics? Well, um, first of all, it's very divisive. I think it, it, um, it uh, will grate on people, right? Um, I don't think it's healthy for a civil society, but in fact, it, it will also cause the very groups um, that may have some you know, issues in terms of you know, wealth creation or, or income right now, from prospering. So let me give you a clear example. First Nations in Canada, if you look at average incomes, the average income of First Nations person is gonna be below that of other Canadians. This is sometimes blamed on racism. And again, there, there are individual racists out there. I'm not denying that for a moment. But I don't think it has to do with systemic or institutional racism for reasons I've, I've mentioned. Um, there are other reasons why First Nations people on average, will, on average will have lower incomes than other Canadians. And it has a lot to do with the fact that a good chunk of indigenous Canadians or First Nations Canadians more specifically live on reserve, live in rural areas. What does this speak to? Well, if you're in Northern Manitoba on a flying reserve, you're far away from educational opportunity and economic opportunity and career opportunities. Now, what we know from Statistic Canada though, and this is positive because it speaks to location and it speaks to education. If you're a young adult, an indigenous young adult with a bachelor's degree and you work all year, full time, full, you know, full days, you have an income that is $500 higher than other Canadians who are young adults, 25 to 34 years old, who also have a bachelor's degree, who also work full year, full time. What does this speak to? Well, it says, it, maybe the geography and the lack of education, average education levels, 
are in part to blame for lower averages among First Nations Canadians. But the positive thing is that's changeable, right? Mm -hmm. You can move off reserve, we hope. You can move to a city, you can get an education, you can get a bachelor's degree. Um, and when you do that, all of a sudden the incomes are very, very similar for Canadians. So that's very positive. But again, it, it, it kind of hollows out this notion that everything has to do with systemic racism mm -hmm. these days. No, geography matters, family matters, you know, where you live matters. And I guess another point with uh, some of these remote reserves is hopefully you see this happening more now in Alberta, Saskatchewan and yeah. British Columbia as you can partner with the resource industry, right. which really are the only jobs uh, that you're ever going to have in a lot of these communities from a geographical perspective. Well, especially, right? yeah, if you're in a remote location, you're lucky if you've got a diamond mine or an yeah. oil reserve or, you know, a natural gas facility. Yeah. Um, that won't solve all problems, right? Because, again, some places may not have natural resources. Yeah. They may be flying. But, but certainly, I mean, that's one of the reasons some First Nations have succeeded. And in fact, the gentleman who wrote the foreword to the book, Alice Ross, was really instrumental in getting yeah. the Heisler First Nation uh, to prosperity by working with natural gas companies, right, yeah. and doing deals. And that, again, speaks to the culture of opportunity. And I think Ellis Ross and his fellow counselors, former counselors when he was on the Heisler First Nation Council, mm -hmm. should be congratulated because they never, you know, denied the past of discrimination in Canada against First Nations mm -hmm. people. But what they did is they said, OK, how can we move forward? What's the reality today? And Ellis, as he says in the forward to the victim cult, he figured out very quickly the problem was not fundamentally the Indian Act. The, the problem fundamentally was not what happened 50 years ago or 150 years ago. Um, the problem was more cultural. And he and his fellow uh, counselors really helped turn around the culture, I think, mm -hmm. of the highs of First Nation to an opportunity forward looking culture um, with full acknowledgement of what happened in the past. I think that's 100 percent the case. And I think. Uh, one thing that you mentioned at the start, which I think is so illustrative of this entire point in this entire conversation, is we're talking about uh, this corrosive way of uh, this corrosive ideology, this corrosive way of looking at society that that spans um, you know tens of thousands, millions of people. But it's the same kind of thing you know in individuals. Everyone has a friend or a family member who thinks this way that they're always the victim. And I think the solution as you pointed out, is, is taking responsibility and looking right. forward to the opportunities that are in front well, of you. Well, let me give you one last positive example. My grandmother um, was three years old in 1914, mm -hmm. and her and her family tried to move to Canada in 1914 from Ukraine. They go to the port of Labau in Latvia. They can't, they can't come to Canada because they've got eye disease and World War I breaks out. And they travel around Central Europe and end up in Siberia. And it takes them 13 years to make their way to Canada. Um, for the rest of their lives, when I was a kid growing up, my parents were and grandparents were in Kelowna. Um, I noticed my grandmother one time signed a legal document with an X. She didn't know how to read or write. She was illiterate. But I never heard my grandparents complain mm -hmm. about Canada or the opportunities lost while she was a child refugee. And they could have. They, they were victims. They were actual victims. And my, my grandfather had similar experiences to my grandmother. Um, but I remember at the end of their life, you know, they would, they would plant uh, roses and they had the, the greenest lawn you could ever see. And in their back garden, though, they would have fruit trees. And there were the similar fruit trees to where my grandmother grew up in Ukraine. And I often wondered, um, I wonder if that was her hearkening back to the most positive parts of her childhood. And to me, that always made sense. Because when I think about it, despite all the awful things that happened to my grandmother that I, I can't imagine how she dealt with, how she survived. She never lived as a victim. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a perfect way to end it. I think that's wise advice. Uh, obviously, we're talking about kind of cultures and societies, but for individuals uh, about how to live their own lives. So thank you very much for taking the time to chat with me. Thank you. And uh, the book is available in, uh, first of all, through Amazon. There'll be a link in the description of this video. Uh, and then also in, in some local bookstores, book chapters, book Indico, markmilkey.com. You can find it. And there's ebooks available available as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Aaron.